Hello and welcome back inside the Park for me for podcast number 777, or as my dear friend John at Boeing would say, the triple seven. That's right. This is Todd. No, Todd, not now. A.K. Negative Camber. You know why I've asked you here. You must convince the villagers that I'm harmless. That's all I need you to do. Tonight, for your kind consideration, we're going to review some F1 news and in particular, some American F1 news, believe it or not. So if you're not American, I apologize. But before talking about that news, I have to introduce my co-host tonight, which, of course, means I have to go all the way to the right coast of America, nestled squarely in our nation's capital, applying her skills as a master statistician. You know her. You love her. It's the lovely, the redoubtable. Grace! Grace, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Todd. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, pray tell, what kitty is in your lap there? Oh, this is Ziggy. That's Ziggy. Okay. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how long she stays. All right. So, Grace, right now, for anyone who watches our podcast, they're probably just losing their minds if they are Attack on Titan fans. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I, I mentioned I mentioned earlier that uh, so I broke. It was anime only for a long time, and then last year I broke down and read the rest of the manga, and so. If anybody makes it through last night's episode to whenever the next set of episodes are being anime only, my my hat's off to you because ooh, it left you a quite a quite a cliffhanger. Yeah. On the spot. So yeah, I'm all in. I mean, two cool. of my cats are named after Attack of Titan characters, so cool. Levi and Mikasa. So it seemed I love it, it. it seemed right um, in the middle of a pandemic where we were all trapped inside to name your cats after an anime that's really about kind of end of the world. So yeah. It worked. Hey, why not? So, yeah. well, I like it. Well, tonight it, it's uh, it's an all American podcast. So, although I am wearing a shirt that has Pierre Gasly's number on it, but it does say USA on it and my hat. So, it is an all American podcast. I could yell at you like uh, uh, Ricky Ardo does. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Gasly. You know. Right, right. Or Netflix are real bumps, aren't they? Uh huh. They are, Dan. That's right. Especially that latest season, huh, Dan? So, um. Uh, Anyway, tonight we are going to cover Formula One news, and it happens to have a particular American uh, twist to it. And oddly enough, your two guests are American, Grace and I, and we're going to talk about that news. So let's jump in to perhaps one of the bigger stories last week that broke about America and racing in America. You know what I'm talking about. Vegas, baby. Vegas. Vegas, baby. Las Vegas is officially announced, F1 announced, that there will be a third race in the U.S. hosted in Las Vegas. It will be a night race starting at 10 p.m. on the streets, including a rundown, some or a portion of the famous Strip. So at 10 p.m. See, now this is quite a departure, folks, because 10 p.m. here, it'll be in the wee hours in the U.K., and, uh, and the roles will be reversed because typically, if you're an American F1 fan, here's the way I always equate it. So the rest of the world used to, usually likes to sit down, have a cocktail, watch the Formula One race. It all is well and good. Not Americans. Americans associate Formula One with coffee because yeah. it's always yeah. in the wee hours. And, and a matter of fact, there's a lot of American fans that they have different coffee for different races, right? So oh. uh, we take, you know, that's, so it's kind of funny. So if you quit having a nice beer or a cocktail watching a, a Formula One race, Americans is always coffee. Not all Americans. I mean, some, some maybe, you know, working the night shift, just got off having a beer, watching oh. the race. Who knows? So yeah. this is the big news. Uh, it's interesting as the Americans were all rejoicing over here, there was also some commentary from across the pond as well as here in the U.S. who were wondering if three American or three U.S. races was actually too much, too many races in America. No, it's, and if it, it's if a, it wouldn't dilute the series. No, it's a big country. It is. It's a big country. Those are like three different parts of this country. Yeah, it's a big just, country. I don't think it. Dream I don't stay think with you. It. Oh, sorry. I guess I, I just you know um, yeah. So it would be like having three races in Europe. Oh wait, we have a whole bunch of races in yeah, Europe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. It's a big country. So I, I yeah. think I, I'm, I'm not worried about that. They're in three very different locations, and two of them are street courses. So 
Yeah. So I, I got to look at this. I wrote an opinion piece on the website about it, but I got to looking at it and I kind of went and looked at the different comments about the race and the concerns of dilution or whatever it might be. Um, and I found some comments, you know, saying that, you know, they were drawing conclusion that it means that less people are going to go to Coda or Miami or even Vegas if there was three separate races, three different times, people on the West Coast just wouldn't go to Coda. They just wait for Vegas and vice versa. And I agree with that, but I was thinking, yes, that's probably true. So maybe the attendance that may have drawn from right and left coast to go to Austin for the race may not go to the Austin race. If they have one closer, they may go there. But I have to think in aggregate, you would have more overall fans attending races in America than just one race, right? Just by proxy, I, right? I think what will happen, so Vegas will have no problem, right? Because there are people that will just go for that weekend. I mean, that's, sure. Vegas is good for about four days. Any more than four days, I don't know why you're still there, right? Like Vegas right. is definitely a long weekend kind of place and that's it. Um, so they'll have no problem. Plus there'll be people that just happen to be there that weekend that'll now just be like sucked into all of this you know which is how uh that's why you have a street course that's why you have a you know a race in the middle of a downtown city like that because then you can be people just sort of wander upon it or, right there'll know, be people I there saying well we were here for the outdoor and camping show uh you know into the convention and then there was a race yeah. broke out yeah, they'll just wander out of the flamingo and there'll be a, right. a, a race, right? So right. I don't think that's a problem. But I think that, I, in my opinion, if if I'm going to go to one of the three, I'm still going to go to Coda, even though I've been there before, because that's going to be an actual race. I have I am not a fan of street races, especially for Formula One and especially the Vegas track. It does not look very exciting. Well, it's you, like Monaco, right? Yeah, that's not yeah. Why so we're going you, there. Yeah, you bring a good point, and and this is one of the other, and it was actually more of a common comment I was seeing oh, from both uh, uh, Americans and non-Americans, to be honest with you. The other concern was the proposed track layout, which seemed a bit like, almost kind of like a large oval with a few turns here and there. But yeah. it's, I got to admit, at first blush, it, it does not, seem like the kind of street circuit that we've become accustomed to like jetta monaco sochi singapore at all right it it, it seems this is a really long straight then it kind of goes around a few turns long long and then it kind of goes in a loop you know and i don't know first blush i was i i will admit i was a little concerned about the layout there is some concern i would hazard to guess that a lackluster track that might produce a ho-hum race may be actually a bit of a shadow on the backdrop of Vegas, which is they're trying to use to really amp up the event, right? So you say, it's Vegas, baby. And, Whoa, yeah, it's Vegas. We go gamble. We have a party and blah, blah, blah. And, oh, yeah, and the race is like, oh. right? And there's some concern about that. Um, and, and, I, I, and I might add, it was from both camp, Americans and non-Americans. I think us as anoraks are concerned about that, but we're the only ones that are concerned about that. Right, right. You know, right? right? Like, right. that's fine. I said, there are people that, um, they're, they're okay with that, that, you know, that the racing wasn't that great. I mean, I just think, I, I think that we all have to think about like the first time we saw an F1 car, the first time you ever went to a race. Like, I think there is still something spectacular about watching those cars, even if sure. the race is boring, right? And yes. you've never witnessed uh, open wheel racing or open wheel racing at that speed. I mean, I think all of that um, will be attractive. Um, to the drive to the survive crowd or the like I just walked I just stumbled out of Brio and oh look there's a race right right um I do think I do think it's interesting because you know to drive down the strip is one thing but then you like turn a corner and there's nothing like if you've never yeah. been to Vegas there's like the strip and that's it right, yeah, right and so right. um there's a reason why the the old race was just in Caesar's parking lot right like, right. <laughs> right there right. is nothing else on I kind of either side of the strip itself and so right. I'm not I'm sure that's part of why the layout is kind of like this big, long straight. And then we kind of do this thing and then we get back on the straight because the straight is going to be where it looks nice. And there's all this stuff and all the casinos and right. uh, the rest of it. It's just, you know, buildings in the middle of a desert. Um, yeah, it, you know, and it, and you're right. It's gained F1 has gained a massive new following with drive survive. But as we know, yeah. uh, the series takes some 
let's call it creative liberties with the script and entertainment value, if you will, of the show. And this yeah. means that F1 has to produce a good product uh, in Coda, Miami, or Vegas, or it may not pay off in the long term um, as a feature American F1 race if any one of those isn't really producing really exciting or, or good racing. Um, so, yeah, there's some thought about that. Um, I think only about Miami missed has, expectations, but yeah, I think only Miami has to worry about that. I think yeah, Vegas probably being, it'll I carry think Vegas, right? Yeah. Vegas being Vegas will carry, right? Just like yep. Monaco's being Monaco, it'll carry, right? Right. And right. Coda is a great track, and we'll all keep going there, and so that's not a problem. I think Miami Beach is what's going to be problematic if that's not a great yeah. race because it's not in South Beach, and um, right, yeah. You're not just rolling out of your hotel in South Beach and going to a race like you would be in Vegas. So right. um, that's the only one I'd really be worried about not staying on the calendar long term. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good point. Um, then there are those who feel that three races in the U.S. means that we'll have two fewer races elsewhere in the world at far better circuits. Right? Well, that's so, never that's always been true. Yeah. And that's never stopped F1 before. No. I mean, you know, they're going to go where the money pays. Um, okay. uh, and this happens to be a pretty large market they want to tap anyway. And they've mm -hmm. and it's been an elusive market. If you really consider the last time Americans were really kind of enthralled in Formula One was back when Americans uh, this is post-war. Uh, when Americans sort of fell in love with the whole European sports car in the 60s, right? Um, you know, they go camp out at Watkins Glen because it was a, you know, is part of a cultural, uh, you know, mm -hmm. movement as it was racing, right? And so there was this love affair. Uh, you had California hot rodders in the 50s and 60s. And, you know, it was this sort of burgeoning motorsport era. And America was not impervious to it either. And so I think in a lot of ways, this is back when they had that sort of love affair with, uh, with, the, with the series. Um, now, effectively you've missed two generations and so formula one and bernie you know well whatever either you're going to take it or you're not whatever you'll right. go elsewhere right but liberty this is one of the things they said when they bought formula one is that they wanted to add more races in the u.s and to their credit that's exactly what they've done here you've got austin miami and las vegas um so we'll have to see you know how that plays out i will say that even on that opinion piece that i wrote on our website uh, there's a lot of mixed reviews. You know, it wasn't a slam dunk on on a if they thought three races was perfectly fine. There were some that didn't think that. Some hated the track layout. Um, others felt it was diluting. Who knows? But yeah, not a not a cut and dried argument anyway. No, I think what well, so one. I think it's hard until we see. I think what's unprecedented is having two new races so close to each other in the yeah, same right. country. Right? Like right. that doesn't. So. Um, having both we kind of have to see how miami works and we have to kind of see how vegas works and um but yeah i can this pains me to say it but i really think that vegas is basically sochi right, it, yeah, right. It's, it's not on the calendar because it's some great track it's on the calendar because somebody with a lot of money wanted to have the track there and we're all going to go there because it's like a resort zone right right it's, it's not right. that's so i don't know i i'm just going to keep my expectations low for what the actual racing is going to be like and just just try to like like go into Disney World. Just go with the flow. Just try not to overthink mm -hmm. it. Just enjoy that, you know, this exists and it'll be fine. And I'm sure it says in the press release, and I just cannot remember because I read so much, you know, every week. Um, I'm sure they were sort of hinting where it would fit in the calendar. And I can't remember, you know, it, it would always make logical sense if they came over to North America and did Canada, the races in America, Mexico, Brazil, right and just sort of get this hemisphere and then go back um but i can't remember if they're running the u.s races anyway back to back uh perhaps they will because logistically that makes the most sense um and coda being in the fall and you know if it's a night race that's somebody did the math at las vegas because if you have it during the day i mean you go outside and just it's spot weld to the pavement Gosh. yeah right yeah it gets brutal 
Yeah, I it got a, a I got a, yeah, and I got a buddy, uh, Jack, a friend, a dear friend of mine, wonderful guy, uh, who's big time into karting, and he lives in Vegas. And I used to joke with him. I said, Jack, yeah, but Jack, it's a dry heat. He goes, yeah, yeah you know. go stick your head in a hundred twenty yeah. degree oven. That's a dry heat too, you know. Right, right. <laughs> so. But I was, yeah, I think that. So I mean, I, there's a part of like there's the anorak in me that's like, this is gonna this is gonna suck, and then there's the part of me that's like. But we'll just embrace it. Like, just go with it. It'll be fine. It'll be fun. Maybe it'll only last a couple of years. Maybe it won't. But at least they tried. And it's yeah. something different. And I do think I, Vegas will totally embrace it. I think that's there's totally space yeah. for that. I just wish the track was better, but you're not going to get a better layout because it's a street right. course. So. Well, you never know. They you know they may have the original track, then they may make some changes. This is what we saw uh, already this year. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, Jetta, right? I think as I think as they, I don't think you know. So they often talk about how like seat time is seat time. Like you can prepare as much as you can in the sim and practice, but until you're in the seat in the race with the lights going off, that's when you really see somebody's you know uh, skill in a car, right? right There's only right. so much you can do. That seat time is seat time. It's the same way. It's not until you start like building it in earnest that you go, oh, there's a manhole cover here, or oh, yeah. you know so-and-so won't let us on his property or uh, you know like so right now it's still an abstract so it seems like a good idea but until you start getting those contracts written and the jersey barriers put up and then you'll really start to see how this track is going to take right uh take hold somebody just well, had to draw it's kind of like this track over here where is it over yeah. here yeah. so this is cody you see that inside curvy bit which some people call the mickey mouse section yes. right there so and grace got me that by the way that mm -hmm. outline um this uh, little curvy bit right there, um, you know, that was supposed to be sort of profiled after turn eight at Turkey. Uh, but I remember I was talking to the CEO, Bobby Epstein, who's the CEO, and we were having a phone call one day. I was chatting with him about it and about, you know, what changes they may make. And, and he admitted, he said, yeah, it just it didn't quite turn out what we were hoping, you know. Right. And I said, yeah, it's a problem is it's not carrying enough speed to the corner or after the corner really um he said yeah and he goes you know if i if i was ever to re-profile the track in some ways you know i'd like to take that whole corner and bank it you know I, that would be great and that would be great you know so and and who knows he may yet you know now that he's uh, extended his deal uh, what, 10 yeah. years or something like that but anyway yeah we'll see but um think, yeah I go think ahead. all the i was just gonna say i think all the turns at coda because they don't have names but the, so many of them were inspired by corners at other tracks that I think that's how they should be named. Like, you know, this is Monza, and then you go into, you know, Silverson, and then you go into Spa, Turkey. and then you're like, yeah, right. Like, each each turn should just be named after whatever track it was borrowed right. from or inspired by, right? Right, right. That's how I would name those corners. I agree. So anyway, yeah, I think time will tell, but I think, Grace, mm -hmm. I do think uh, you're on to, I do think Let's Vegas see. will embrace it. Vegas is made to host thousands oh, yeah. and thousands they, of people. The amenities, everything is over yeah. the top. I was uh, there so for, mm -hmm. great place. I was there for a wedding. Best wedding ever, right? Like they know yeah. what they're doing to the T. They're like, you want this drink, you want this now, and then you're going to do some of this and you're going to do this. And you're like, that guy's right, right? Because that guy's been doing this for his whole life, right? So right. that part, it, it is made for it. I think if I was Miami and, uh, you know, whoever came up with that, I'd, I'd be sweating bullets. That's right. who I would be most nervous. Not the guy in Vegas, not Bobby Epstein. I'd right. be nervous. For Miami. I remember the first time I went there, Grace, and I, I got out. I got out there. Well, the first thing I went with my dad, mm -hmm. and we got there at the hotel, and he said, "Come, come here for a minute." And we walked out, and we walked down to the strip, the street there, and he said, "Look down that way." And I looked down that way, and he says, "Now look down that way." And I looked down. And he says, "See all those casinos?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "They didn't build those by losing." No, that is that, correct. Okay, good point. But yeah. I remember thinking, all right, well, you know, I don't know, he was doing something. And I thought, well, I'll just walk down. You know, I see the Caesars down there. I'll just go down to Caesars. And you start walking. And you start walking. And you're walking. It's oh, like, it's how so damn far. far is this place? And you're walking and walking and walking. My gosh, it's right there. How far? And then you get down there, and you realize the damn sign is the size of 600 football fields. Yes. No wonder it looks so close, right? So... Yeah, that's it's pretty so funny. Far. Every that's a good advice. If you've never been to Vegas and you're gonna go, make sure every I always left an hour. 
to go from one casino yeah. to the next is an hour. Everything takes an hour to get to because everything is so, even if you're on the strip where it's a straight line, it's still going to take you an hour to walk yeah. anywhere Yeah, because it does. it's, everything is so huge. That is very, that is very good advice that yeah. everything, but go for food. That's why I go. We go for yeah, food yeah. the shows. So oh, yeah. The food's great. Delicious. Yeah. So it should be a good event, even if the track isn't that great. And I would right. think. Yeah, they'll adjust it if need be, but we'll see. Yeah, I think so. We'll see. Yeah. They have time, we'll and yeah, yeah. I, I'm just I worry for Miami Beach, Miami Gardens. Isn't that what it is? Yeah, Miami, Miami Gardens. Gardens. That's exactly right. I worry yeah. a little bit for those guys, but that's right. Why? Because Vegas, baby, Vegas. That's it, Vegas. All right. Next up, because there is this third race in the U.S., this prompted conversation about. Well, that's great. Oh, sorry, folks. That's my dog. <laughs> that prompted the conversation of, well, um, now we have three races in America and, a, and an American team, but no American driver, right? So American driver wanted, the natural question about three races in the US and a US owned team is, where's an American driver? The first name now recently that seems to be popping up anytime this conversation happens or any news stories is that of Colton Herta and in the IndyCar series. And he is going to be actually testing a 2021 McLaren car this year at some time uh, in conjunction with uh, knowing Zach and all that. Um, and, and so anyway, Zach agreed to that. Um, there is continuing interest from Michael Andretti to create a team and field Colton Herta, right? And he's made that Great. comment. Uh, but there seems to be, I don't know, there doesn't seem to be a lot of interest in letting Michael Andretti start a team in Formula Surprise. One. Yeah. What? And uh, it's guy? a little interesting. Nor is there any seeming interest about Michael possibly buying Gene Haas's Haas F1, right? Not now. For some reason. Yeah, not now, right? So I'm assuming the, I'm just thinking about logically about Formula One is why would the other teams have an issue with Andretti creating a team coming in? My knee jerk reaction is because it cuts the prize money yet, an, yet again to 11 teams instead of 10. And they're probably very comfortable with the business model with 10 teams and everybody gets paid. Yeah, and 11, somebody didn't get paid as much, right? Um, so that's a possibility. Um, you know, and we often talk about Andretti, but we often talk about Mario Andretti. You know, where's you know, Mario Andretti's an American driver? But let's be honest here. Mario Andretti could hang with anyone in F1. And, and, and at the time that he was racing, I mean, he'd hang with anyone and race, and he won a world championship. I mean, he's a real deal, right? And the driver, you know, he was... The American driver needs to be more than just American. Let me put it that way. And while yeah. Herda is the most recent name everyone talks about, I'm not so sure that we've even found the right person yet. And this may take time to find the talent that could run with Max, Lewis, Charles, Pierre, even Pierre, Esteban, and Lando in the midfield, right? You mean it wasn't Scott's speed? Yeah, it wasn't Scoot speed. Scoot. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's true. I think the other thing is, is that if you can have three races in America and they're successful and there's no American driver, then that lo no longer becomes your interest point, right? Like you, right. you don't need Michael Andretti in order to have racing in America in the United States. Right. So, right. Right. It's well, fine. And there's no pressure for that. Stefano Dom Dominicali, the, the boss of F1 said that he doesn't want the American driver to be a boomerang effect, right. meaning that it needs to be real. And that's the key here. Uh, a mm -hmm. real competitor, right? Right. Um, not a scoot speed, so to speak. Yeah, you mean long time listener, Stefano Domenicali. Yes, long time yeah. listener and fan <laughs> of the part right. from a Stefano No, I, but that's the thing too, is because it's only going to dilute it, right? So if you hurry, if you hustle in somebody who isn't ready, you know, you end up with a Pastor Maldonado, right? Like you end up in some situation that nobody really wanted to be in. And then that kind of right. like, leaves a, a bitter taste in everybody's mouth for anybody, uh, any other American driver who might come along. Right. 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 So I think you do want to make sure it's the right person. Um, because there's, and especially cause there's so much, it's more than just driving. Right. And yep. so you have to have all those other sponsory things that go into it and the meet and greets and, um, 
uh, that goes into being a driver. It's not just you're in a car and you're fast. Only Kimi Raikkonen got away with that. Nobody right. else can get away with that, right? Right, right. right. So. so anyway, watch this space. We'll see what happens as far as an American driver. Uh, speaking of Haas, American team uh, Haas, this just in, upgrades in Formula One are overrated. Yep. Who knew? Who knew? Well, I'll tell you who, Grace. <laughs> Gunther Steiner knew, the team boss of Haas F1. He says that people need to right-size their expectations. My word's not his. Right-size their expectations on upgrades. Here's what he actually said. He said, quote, we will bring updates as well, but I always feel like upgrades are overrated. People like to hear that you're bringing update upgrades. But if, you're, if you bring upgrades for one, two, or three downforce points, the the parts looks different, but what does it actually do? Uh, that's important to me. If you ask an aerodynamicist, they will bring to every Grand Prix a yeah. million dollars worth of upgrades for one point. But that needs to be managed on a budget cap more than anything else. I'm not going to say that nobody brings good ones, but I think they're a little bit overrated sometimes. I want to stay calm this year intentionally. Not because we haven't got money, but because I want to get the package together. We need to see if it brings a certain amount of points that we can measure. And if we can make good progress and we don't change the balance of the car, then introduce it. But not just running around like we need upgrades left, right, and center. Let's focus on the car, understanding it, and get the best out of what we've got, end quote. Um, That's great. Now, he's got a point here. In that back in the day, Grace, as you know, mm -hmm. with unlimited or enormous budgets, you could put that kind of money into two points of arrow, right? Right. And so, and, and let me unpack that real quick. So, uh, apologies uh, for for people that may be new to Formula One. So, um, so if let me try to explain this. If how do I say this? Okay. I know it's 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 a little difficult. Um, if you're new to F1, sorry for the mental block. The point, the point in arrow he's speaking about, is the way they measure the sensitivity between coefficient lift and coefficient drag, or what we know is air downforce and drag, effectively. Okay, and the drag sensitivity, if you will between the two elements. They refer to that as a percentage of lap time reduction for every point they increase in either downforce or drag. So if a car has 4.65, let's say, and they add a point, it would be 4.66 instead of 4.65. Um, now, having said that, you would think then in a world of cost caps, Guther should be in the same boat as the rest of the teams and that none of them can really afford to spend millions chasing a point. But as we all know, it's more complicated than that. The point he is trying to make here is that he doesn't want to spend on development unless they feel they have a strong return on investment for that point gain in aerodynamic downforce or drag coefficient, the sensitivity between the two in aero efficiency. But that's much easier said than done you know, to sort of do that without prototyping and those kind of things. So I'm curious if this might impact their overall development arc going forward with this sort of cautious approach to development, right? Um, and it's hard to know. Uh, this is why it's critical for teams to gain as many points as they can in the world championship early in the season when they might have an advantage, just like Haas does right now. And because if they're out developed mid season, that all goes away, right? Everybody else right. starts to pass you. And then you've got a handful of points you can rely on for prize money. So it's critical that Kevin, Kevin uh, Magnuson is scoring points for Haas right now. That is huge for this team because if they don't develop aggressively and if their developments don't return the arrow points they hoped it would, there are chances that other teams will outdevelop them and pass them, meaning the chances of scoring points later, mid, late season isn't as likely, right? So this right. is why that's really important. Um, and I also do think there's maybe some special accommodations in the cost cap 
for a, a total car, like if you have to rebuild the whole chassis and stuff like Mick did, right? right. Um, I know those discussions were early on um, in the cost cap discussion. So, so anyway, that's kind of what he thinks. He thinks we're a bit overrated. Everybody's doing upgrades. And I agree in the past that was de rigueur, but I think now um, everybody's going to be a little more nervous about it. I think so. And it could also just be cover, right? Like, you know, you see 700 crates coming in to Alpine and you got no crates coming into your, you know, into your garage. You got to say right. something about the fact that they're bringing all these <laughs> upgrades and you're bringing nothing. Right. So, right, right, right. I mean, again, in some ways their jobs are no different than our jobs, right? Like you don't right. want to ever be in the position where you're just throwing everything in the kitchen sink at a problem because that's terrible. It's a terrible place to be and nobody knows what's going wrong. And you're just all trying to like figure out what it is. And and you also don't want to be making needless changes or only changes right. that change things on the periphery. But um, that's his job as well, right? Like that's part of Gunther's job is to kind of yep. manage um, the changes. Because you're right. Anybody in there, you know, like I write questions for a living. You could spend, I could spend all my time writing one question. But at some point it has to end because that's going to testing, right? And it's the same thing that engineers will keep working on that one part, part as long as long as they can because there's always more, there's always could be better. You never reach some level of right. perfection where you're like, and that's the perfect survey question, right? It doesn't right. exist. So other things are what force you to end that process. And so that's part of his job is to go, we've done enough, we're moving on, whether it's because of resources or you're just not getting any, um, you know, measurable difference from it. And it's not worth it. Right, uh, right, that's what right. he's gotta do. And this is also, you know, when teams can afford to buy the most brilliant aerodynamic engineers in the world, then sometimes they can find a lot more points than others can. That's just that's why you're paying the big you know. bucks for those star star employees. That's right. That's why Red Bull pays the money they do for Adrian Newey. That's right. Yep. Um, so anyway, yeah, I hope they don't get hung up on that, but we'll have to see how Haas does. I think the, the telltale sign is, is whether we could, you know, and I think he made a point. We're not saying we don't have money, but yeah, they don't have a lot of money, okay, and yeah. and losing the big sponsor and all that didn't didn't uh, help. So, I don't know how they'll develop over the season. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if they spent all last year focused on this year's car, and it's kind of what they got is what they got, and they didn't develop it because they're going to need the money to keep the team going. You know? Yeah, um, I think that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll see. I think I still think yep. Catalonia is where we'll we may see some upgrades at Monza, but I think um, as you were saying, you got to make all those points before Catalonia because once you get to Catalonia, all bets are off because that's when all the right. bigger teams are going to go. And here's all our development pieces, and right. they're just going to take off. So yep, I agree. All right, next in the uh, news, the Miami Yacht Club. I don't know if you saw this, Grace. This was a, a, a bit of an oddity. So speaking of American races, did anyone else see the tweet from the front office sports uh, group showing the new marina and yacht viewing area at the Crypto.com Miami Grand Prix, which should be renamed the Crypto.com Miami Gardens Grand Prix? Right. Is it near water? I mean, I get it that it's Florida and it's all near water, but is it? Yeah, no, no, no. The parking lot at the Hard Rock Cafe is nowhere near Not the near ocean. Water. No. Right. No. All no. right. So maybe it's just me, mm -hmm. uh, but looking at that picture, it looks like they were installing a shallow pond to put some very large boats in to look like Monaco's harbor. But there's no water around the stadium. Right. There's no way to sail those boats in or out of the pond and the per picture look like you had this little pond and these huge luxurious yachts all in this little puddle and i was thinking that come on man if you were really wanting to be true and realistic and americana about it you would have shown a couple of pontoon boats in there right with people with right. a six pack of beer and grilling not these luxurious monaco style yachts on a little puddle yeah. So I don't know what that's all about. That was really strange. I was looking for the picture. That's that. Yeah, because I'm like, there's this stuff yeah. near water. Mm -mm. 
I mean, visually on TV, you drive by all those big yachts. Yeah, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, okay, wait a minute. That's not a parking lot of a football stadium. Right. And that's not anywhere near the ocean. What's going on there? You know? Um, so, anyway, oh, I don't know. Oh, that was Miami. Oh, Miami. The glam, the glitz, the facade, if you will. So, anyway. All right. Hopefully, we'll it, it visually, I hope it looks great. And um, we'll you're right. See. I'll eat my words. It'll be fine. That'll make yes. us. It makes everybody happy if I'm completely wrong about Miami, even though yes, I don't think right, I am. Right, right. All right. In other American news, our friend Zach Brown has called. Yes. He's the the chief of McLaren. He's called for a calendar rethink at Formula One. Now, here's what he's asking. He's saying, American team boss McLaren, Zach Brown, called for a maximum of 21 possibly 22 races per season with up to eight of those tracks to be rotated out every other year. Zach says that some races will be held every year. These are your A markets, as he called them, with your B markets, as he called them, rotating every other year. Now, if again if you're new to f1 this may seem like an odd idea but it has been done before mm -hmm. with races that could not afford that year on year sanctioning fee right and the most recent in my mind would be germany where we had the nurburgring one year then hockenheim the next year then nurburgring then hockenheim right and that way it gave the circuits a year to recoup gain the money they need to sanction, and they just work that out to keep both those races alive and, quite honestly, to keep a German Grand Prix. Now, apparently, those money, uh, those revenue streams must have just dried up because F1 decided it was done with Germany, which is a real shame. We should have a German Grand Prix. Um, so, you know, but I was also wondering if this is – Stefano also said something last week that he could have been hinting at it when he said last week that, well, you know, it's cause this calendar getting big. A lot of people want races and some yeah. of these existing stalwart races may very well not be on the grid, you know, or on the calendar. Um, so I don't know. Um, but I mean, to be honest, it is a good idea, but like everything else, there's always elements of play here. And what comes to mind, Grace, is the track and economics has to work right in the mm -hmm. end. And maintaining an FIA grade one circuit is a very expensive proposition. So does alternating this alternate model, this alternating model, does that make race promoters and circuit owners whole? Maybe it does. I'm just not sure. Or do they need that yearly revenue in order to make that model work? Right. Right. How else? I don't know how else they're pulling in. Like, like Coda also has a MotoGP race, right? Yes. So like, I don't know what other event, you know, and, and Coda also holds concerts, right? Like it, it's, it's a venue that does other things. I would imagine that would have to right. be part of it, that if your biggest uh, money generator for your track is the Formula One race, then having right. it every other year is not going to help you. You're not going to pull in enough money to make it that long. Especially if you paid 20, 25, $30 million for the fee, for the fee to host right, it. Right, right. Yeah. It's a lot of money and um yeah i don't know i don't know if that if the economics work out i you know zach would know far better than i would um sure. and maybe he knows that you could alternate it and it would work i don't know but um, and maybe only at certain tracks right like yeah and, right right you know because i also think here you know our like the government doesn't pay for coda or vegas or miami gardens but in other countries the government they does do. contribute money or pays for the whole thing so that might be right. a different model too because of who's paying for it, you know, right, um, right, in different countries, how they operate. So that probably makes a difference as right. well. But yeah, and you maybe some sure of those, know. yeah, and maybe some of those B markets are those kind of races, you know. So mm -hmm. to them, not having race just means the government isn't paying out twenty five million, you know. So basically, the tracks that want to have a Formula One race because they want to have a Formula One race versus the tracks that just want to do some sports washing. And those are the right. ones we're going to alternate. Right. Right. Got it. I got right. it, Zach. I'm on the same page right. with you. Right. So right. we could just have a couple, you know, if we have 20 races in a season, you just have 10 random ones that are actual <laughs> races and 10 that are just some sports washing. And we'll just mix them up right. every year. Right. I got it. I got it. Yeah. I got you. There's I mean, B that's... markets. 
Yeah, those are B markets, Grace. Right, right. That's what I got we're going to call this. Yeah, Saudi that's Arabia, Sochi. That's Sochi. It's just a B yeah. market for us. We're just going to give it a miss this year. And then the next yeah. year, say, hey, did anyone miss Sochi? Really? Nope. No. Oh, okay. No, nobody did. Yeah, nobody okay, did. Okay, so then why don't we just have another race somewhere else for people actually want to go? Okay, good right. idea. Right. Yeah. So when you consider races, you know, I know, um, uh, again, you know, f for those who have been watching Formula One a long time, you'll know this. Um, that races come and go, and they have uh, for a long mm -hmm. time. Now, there are the sort of iconic races that have been there always. And I think of Silverstone, Spa mm -hmm. Francorchamps in Belgium, uh, Monza, right? Suzuka in Japan. Right. Um, Canada has been there forever. Um, and some of these, and Brazil has been there quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, some of these are just long. Uh, tracks and and tragic. That's why I say Germany. You know, with with Nurburgring or Hockenheimring, right. um, Magna Cour had been there for a while, but mm -hmm. in France, and now we have Paul Ricard. But anyway, some of these tracks that I mentioned, like Silverstone Spa and those kind of things, Monza, these things are stalwarts of the Formula One calendar. And there was a time uh, not too long ago when Spa, you know, was on the chopping block and couldn't make it or whatever. And it, I mean, it was outraged by f1 fans not having spa on the calendar and you almost had a, a, a damn near a mutiny if yeah for if sure. those aren't on the calendar monza Silverstone, spa suzuka you know those kind of things if they're not on the calendar people freak out mm -hmm. right yeah. and uh because those need to be on the calendar the rest of the races have come and gone you think of and formula one is always going to go where the money is where mm -hmm. they're going to get paid the most that they can get for these uh, races because their business model is based on that all of that sanctioning fee goes into the prize money which is distributed to the teams it used to be in the past that teams didn't rely as heavily on this prize money for their existence because they had tobacco money and massive titles uh, sponsorships right. but once this once f1 grew and the prize money became huge then all of a sudden the sponsors weren't as critical because teams are living off the prize money. So it's right. this circular sort of system of feeding themselves and keeping the machine going, whereas it used to be the machine goes and the team's got to go find the money to participate, right? So this is kind of how it's set up. So, it, yeah, it, it'll be interesting, but those, those races, you know, think of China, India, mm -hmm. Turkey, South Korea, Malaysia, right? These are all races that do not exist. Did I say India? I think I did. These are all races that were un not long ago on the count and they're gone. Vietnam, another one. Right. Didn't even launch, right? Didn't happen. <laughs> right. So look at all those races. There's six races right there that just pff, gone, right? Mm -hmm. And so to Grace's point, if Miami went, pff, you know, don't be yeah. shocked. I mean, that, right. that happens. Um, uh, and so, and no German Grand Prix, right? And for a while, there was no French Grand Prix either, which is a crime. So anyway, um, the rotating thing may help that if some of these could offset some of that, that expense and sanctioning fees on a 24-month cycle instead of 12. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And I don't trust. I wouldn't. I don't know. Maybe it's very different. I also wouldn't trust like if I like when Nurburgring and Hockenheim like rotated years, like what what if one of these years you don't want to rotate? Like I, I have to trust that you're actually going to let me right. back on the calendar again. And I don't I don't trust. I don't I would never trust that. Like, oh, Hockenheim. Oh, your 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 call. I, I, I'm going through a tunnel. Sorry. I, I don't know. And right. Just, never get back to you and Hockenheim never gets back on the calendar again. Hockenheim oh I'm sorry I'm out in the wooded part that they cut off of the track and neutered it right out here where Jim Clark tragically passed away that's where yes. I'm at cell phones right. are dodgy out here so, uh, yeah, yeah I, only, I only have a bar man I'm sorry I'll have to call you back later so yeah, yeah right I, I would always worry about that too that I just would never get back on the calendar after I right. you know gave up my spot if that other track became right. like imagine if you gave up your spot to Vegas or something like that and it's suddenly like what who are you because yeah there's no way a traditional track in europe in the middle of nowhere is going to be able to compete with a track like vegas so right 
And there was, uh, you know, a lot of uh, comments about, gosh, why would they bring Vegas on? Or even Miami at the time said, you know, you got Watkins Glen, you got, uh, you know, Road America, uh, most sport, you got, you know, different locations in North America you go to. And it's kind of like, yeah, I know, but these aren't population epicenters, you know? No, not at all. Ellicott City. Ellicott yeah. Lake? No, four no. people live there. Yeah. Right. These are not population epicenters. And so you can't host thousands and thousands and thousands of people to a race like that uh, and have all the amenities and the ability to get in and out and the things that it takes to host a race like that. So that's why they're right. looking at these population centers. We need more races like Montreal. That just will solve yeah. everything. You just need a metro system that runs to wherever your track is. And it doesn't matter. Right. Problem solved. Right. And then you can have your track somewhere out far away. Because you're right. Even at that, like, Coda isn't in Austin. You have to mm-hmm. drive to Coda. It's an right? Elroy. Yeah, right. And so, um, and it's it's a good drive with some traffic So, um, to get to the track. So, it's the same right. way. I mean, you're right. Watkins Glen is literally in the middle of nowhere, upstate New York. So, it's right. like, where you're, you're sleeping in tents, not because you want the, like, woo, the stay up till 2 in the morning camaraderie. There is no hotel tell what other option you have you're sleeping right. in a van right so but see that was in um, the 60s it was okay it was this whole woodstock vibe and and you know they all kind of went up there camped out tents you know it was kind of the thing that they did it was a, it was a lot more organic than it is now right yeah yeah for sure so, so I, I agree uh, i think you yep. have to have people unless it's china you actually have to have people show up and so that's going to be a problem if you have it in right. Watkins Glen or Ellicott Lake or someplace like that. So you remember when China they couldn't, you know, fill the the stands so they had to go right. bus all these school children in right. and put them all in the stands to make it look like there was a bunch of people there, you know. So right. if you're a Chinese student never seen Formula 1 and you got a free ride up to the circuit and got to sit there and yeah. listen to screaming V8s, I mean, whoa. Uh, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, right. That's yeah. too bad. Yeah. So, or at least that's what I would have done. It's better than it's better than anything I was ever forced to do as a kid. Yeah, that's for me sure. too. Right? Me too. Right. I'd take that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that Terrible. would be a that would be an awesome field trip. Yeah. What What'd you do today? Oh my God! They made me go to a Formula One race. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And study. Well, we had to go to the courthouse and see like yeah. a courtroom and some sort of mock trial thing. Oh I don't my know. gosh. Or I went to Coda and got to watch a Formula One race. It's cool. Or, yeah, growing up in Pittsburgh, everything was, uh, you know, some fort left over from the French and Indian. <laughs> yeah, like, right. Great. Right. Fort again, just as exciting as it was last year when you made me go. Right. right. <laughs> I didn't care then. I don't care now. Right. So, yeah. Uh, same idea. So we went over to the Cahokia Mounds and the Native American tribe, and they had these big burial mounds. And it's just, yeah, we looked at those. And those were cool. Yeah. Or I went to a Formula One race. I don't know. Yeah, right. So it's I just cool. think I'd be way better. I would be way better than going to yeah. yet another fort from the French and Indian War, which I'm pretty sure is all we did when I was in grade school. Yeah. I think you must have had some relatives that fought in that war, Grace. Probably. Yeah. I don't know that. And the Science Center, but I love the Science Center. So there's no Yeah, that's cool. It. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Don't be shy, Grace. Your family tamed the Western wilds of Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's it. For sure. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. I yep. don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Right. Uh, let's see. Oh, is it? T- it's time for some Albin's Cats. Should we do that? Absolutely. Why not? Yes. It's time for some Albin's Cats. Cat, uh, did you have anything for Albin's Cats this week, Grace? So I do. I did first. I wanted to welcome both Ted Kravitz to ESPN and the world of ESPN to yes. Ted Kravitz because now this season I don't have to get NordVPN in order to watch Ted Kravitz or wait until somebody right. legally posted on YouTube. I get to watch it on ESPN like a normal person because we get Ted this year. And so um, he wasn't in Saudi Arabia, but he did a great job in Bahrain, and it was exactly what I think anybody who's listening to this go, why are they talk about Ted Kravitz's notebook all the time? No, he did Ted's not- great. He did not disappoint. I think just for the Williams nightclub dancing sequence was well worth it. So um, welcome. Welcome, Ted. And uh, welcome ESPN to Ted. I'm I'm all for not having to, like, find illegal means to watch Ted. Yeah, not that Um, we did that, but let's just say I never missed a Ted's notebook. Yeah, Yeah. I didn't. You just had to, like, there was less like a, a sweet spot before 
when somebody yes. would post it and before somebody would take it down where you could like, quick watch it. I know there's a quick watch. You had to watch YouTube really quick and they'd throw it up and it'd be up there for, you know, eight hours, six hours, then you had to watch it real quick and then it was done it was gone. Yeah. Yeah. If you Damn yeah, if you, you, if you sky. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Let's see. Um Oh, I also, so I know that the car launches was like a podcast we had like three months ago. Yeah. But I realized that we never talked about the Alpine Triangle Dancers at their car launch, which now if you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, Grace, look up Alpine's car launch. The dancers they had, like we talk about the the people from the Ferrari anniversary that like climbed down yes. the wall, that whole shebang. Yes. These, these Triangle Dancers are pretty impressive. So check that out from the Alpine car launch. I just feel like that got lost in all my my exuberance for car launches so right uh, be sure to check that out um, and maybe I, I missed a memo i thought alpine was going to run this pink livery as sort of a special one-off it was it two yeah, races only okay I thought, two races. I thought it was one race so it's two races so we finally get back to french racing blue as it should be and it's too confusing it I, is i can't I think because it's... i keep they're force india and i think force williams india, is yeah. alpine and i'm like this is like when they wear throwback jerseys and I'm like, I hate that because yeah. all of a sudden Green Bay is wearing red and blue and you're Green Bay. What is this? like? Right. I hate this. I you at least the Steelers, their throwback jersey is still black and gold. I can still follow what's going on. <laughs> right. So right. I hate it. I, I I'm all for special liveries. Like I love the McLaren golf livery. That was great. But this like your your pink that was already a car. We can't I can't. Yeah, it's, I know. My little confusing. brain can't handle it. And I then know. I just I, I also didn't want to let this um pre-season uh quote gem get past us so somebody asked uh, our friend uh Otmar Schnaffnauer uh about you know leaving for uh leaving Aston Martin yeah. to go be at Alpine and he said someone once told me the Catholic Church only has one pope and when you have two popes it's just not right and I was like mm. yeah, that is it so now he's at a team where he's the only pope instead of being at a team with two popes but I thought oh Whitmarsh. Pope yeah. Whitmarsh. Yeah. That's got a fun ring to it, doesn't it? I didn't know Martin was Catholic. Who knew? But Who knew? I just thought I thought, oh, Martin, that's such a that's such a, a nice way of putting something and yet still making it very clear that you hate that guy. You know? Right. Very good. Well, if Martin shows up the next word with holy water or a rosary, we'll know. Yeah. No, he needs the like the incense thing that you The swing. incense, yes. I yes. don't remember what that's called anymore, but yeah, he needs that thing, you know, yes. so just go into the pit and, you know, get rid of all the demons. Yes, that's exactly what he needs. Yes, exactly. I like it. Clean out their pit box for him. So only one pope. <laughs> right. Right. Dude, we're going to cut the animal in half and we're going to walk between the car and the two cleaving pieces and we're going to have a covenant. And, and we'll by know. golly, Aston Martin's going to win. We'll know who the real owner is. That's right. So well, Lawrence, I, I just, well, yeah, you'll come in and adjust his junk on the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lawrence. Gross. It's gross, Lawrence. Gross. So anyway, all right. Lawrence is gross. Yeah. That might be the nicest thing I've ever said about him, actually. So really, I don't know him. I, you know, I don't know. I that is. I just okay, like to first... poke fun at the fact that he stuck his hand down his pants right in front of Claire's face. I don't know any of the people we've talked about on the course of this podcast. That has never stopped me before. If I only talked about people I knew, this would be very, very boring. Right. Well, I know some of More them. people I know. I've met some of them, but well, Lawrence is not one of them. I have never met him, nor do I know him. So. I, I honestly, I don't think Lawrence would like me at all. I just don't. I don't think yeah. he likes anybody. I don't even think it's he likes Lance. It's a feeling Lance. I get. Yeah, he, he may not. Like, I don't think he likes Lance. I don't, I, I don't see that, like... <laughs> So what do we have to have for this stupid old house, drafty house? And what do we have to have all these kids anyway? Right. I, I mean, <laughs> if you can't like your own son, then uh, how can I compete with that? I don't, you know? Know. I don't know. I don't know. Poor Lance. He do, he's doing so. the best he can, though, you know? He is. Yeah, he's just, you know, Flex, smiling away, boys. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's right. the. It's too cuts bad. His, cuts his hair with a floby. It's fine. Yes. The precision cut of the floby. Yes. yes. Those youngsters out there, you have to Google Floby for haircuts. Yeah. You know oh, what we're man, talking that's about. sad that they've never seen those commercials. They were great. Hey, great. you know what? When when the season started and McLaren came out their uh, Google-inspired uh, livery, 
Yes. Right when it came out, I saw those wheel covers, and the first thing I thought is is the old Simon Gang game. Yeah. Right. I you saw it. I posted a picture of it. Yes. Right. Long before the second race of the season. Yeah. So I'm thinking Crofty saw that because he brought it up on the Sky thing. And he says, you know what that looks like? It looks like that old Simon game. And then everybody on the broadcast made him feel like an idiot, like he was old, because nobody knew what that was. He was like, oh, dating yourself there. And he's like, oh. So that that whole thing, my joke about the Simon game sunk like a lead balloon. And I apologize, Crofty. I should have been better with my content. No, see, the thing is, is I think it's just his delivery. Like if, if Karun had said that joke, everybody would have oh, thought it would be it was hilarious. Funny, right? If Button had said that joke, it would have been funny. It's just because yes. it's crafty. He doesn't have the delivery for a joke of that caliber. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. They Maybe still have Simon. I don't think that's a. Ah, I didn't either. I you know. Still exists. I posted it. Well, I posted it and everybody kind of liked it. So. Yeah, just know. like. A... It just fell flat when Crofty said it. So I apologize. Because I know you saw it, Crofty. I know you did. Long time listener. Long time listener. That's all right. First time caller. Min- Dominicali only steals the good ideas, apparently. Yeah, right, know. right, right. right. He only steals your ideas. He doesn't steal mine wisely. So I that's have lots good. Of them, so yeah. I'll help Formula One however I can. Yeah. All right. You ready for uh, some of Todd's No Shit headlines? Uh, absolutely. This is my okay. favorite. All right. Here we go. Oh, boy. Have a Tom Cruise. Here we go. Headline number one. Total Wolf slams unacceptable Mercedes performances ahead of Austin's Australian Grand Prix. <laughs> what? You're slamming it. You're in charge. <laughs> it's your responsibility. Why would you be? Sa- that is written like Toto is not even associated with that team. Toto slams unacceptable Mercedes performance ahead of. I mean. Read it. A Christian Horner slams unacceptable Mercedes performance ahead of Australia. Right. You're the boss. That's right. Karen uh, Horner thinks everybody's terrible. It's fine. Right. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I did love that was, I guess it was right. after Bahrain that that was uh, trending. I was like, that is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Karen Horner. Karen Horner that never, like never stops being funny to me either. It's um, tomorrow. That's right. But, you know, and I think the thing is, is that the actual quote is probably something like, you know, because it's Toto. He's always very, you know, he's usually kind of uh, in the interviews. Like, in the moment, yeah, he does the slamming that we all watch, and he's broken down. the headset. Yes. But, like, in the, like, conversations and the interviews afterwards, he's always very measured, right? He's always just like, yeah, this yeah. isn't what we were expecting. Right. We've got to figure out what's going on with Lewis. George had a pretty good race. We'll see you next week. Right. Are I'm you sure feeling a, a little slam. sorry? Are you feeling a little sorry for George in this big moment? You know, I think... No, I'm a McLaren fan. I feel sorry for McLaren. <laughs> Could we just like get an engine that lasts for like, I swear, it's like, what engine's going to be successful year? Who did McLaren sign as their engine? Not them. Yeah. Come on, man. I just feel bad for George's big moment, and he's getting beat by Valtteri Bottas in, in an Alfa Romeo. <laughs> I will say uh, that. I, I mean, Valtteri Bottas. So Bottas, I totally, when we did our preseason, I was like, ah, Alfa, they're going to have so many problems. Mm-hmm. And watching Bahrain, I was like, oh, I guess I was completely wrong. And then watching Jed, I was like, all right. I mean, it's not him. We know he can drive. He wasn't a Mercedes driver because he sucked. But no. I just think that Alpha's got – Alpha's just going to be like hit or miss, right? They're either going to win or they're going to be yeah. terrible. And there's just going to be no in between. So right, it's going to be tough for both of us. It is. All right, next headline. Here we go. If you so, my question is: Do you need a glowing endorsement for Vegas? Well, here is a headline that does just that. "Quote: What happened the last time F1 was in Las Vegas and the worst circuit ever that caused injuries to drivers?" End quote. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Huh? Worst circuit ever. Well, it did go around the Caesar's Palace parking lot. I mean, it was terrible. Mm. I'm not saying yeah. I'm not saying it was good, but. I don't know, yeah. worst circuit ever. But what happened the um, last time F1 was in Las Vegas at the worst circuit ever that caused injuries to drivers? What injuries? Uh, well, yeah, there were people that crashed and got hurt. But yeah, anyway, oh. I, that's just a weird headline. I um, don't know. I think uh, I don't know. Just just embrace it, people. Yeah, move it's on. Fine. 
move on. You know, uh, let's go back and Google something. Let's Google some history, and then we can get all irate about it. Um, Google, wait, before you move forward, speaking of Googling some history, did you know that Fangio was once kidnapped? Yes, in Cuba. I, I, yeah, right? Yes. See, yeah. I totally didn't missed, know that. Missed the race. Was it 50, yeah. 58? 58, look at you. Yeah. yeah, 58. He won in 57. Yep. They kidnapped him in 58 when 58. he came back. But they let right. him listen to the race. They they and did. They he, let him, the end... and then they released him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he just said, oh, it was just an adventure. I'm like, right. that is a different time. Yeah. It really came up because, you know, we were talking of, I, I know that, you know, um, Saudi Arabia, it's mm -hmm. sort of old news at this point. But, you know, that, like, why the drivers, why the team principals met for, like, 20 minutes and decided it was okay but the drivers met for like 12 hours yeah, right. right because they right. have all the risk right? right um and so that was when it, it came up that uh you know flip was like didn't you know that that happened i was like it did i didn't know so yeah. other people maybe not know that fangio right. was kidnapped and then even back then the drivers still carried all the risk of like being the public persona that's out there and that if you were going to steal somebody or their laptop or gas a hotel room those things aren't going to happen to total wolf yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't remember if it was Che Guevara or uh, uh, in association with Castro, but it was basically Castro. You yeah, know, it was Ca mm -hmm. Castro who did it. Yeah. Before he took over Cuba, right? And yeah. they just let him let him watch the race. I thought, yeah, oh, all right, here's right. some tea. Enjoy the race. That right. You're not in that you should supposed to be in because right. we, you know, stole you from your hotel room. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. crazy. Okay. It is. Uh, let's see. What's next? Uh, oh, this is great. This is good. One. Here's the headline. Oh, Marco yeah. questions Vettel's Aston Martin motivation. So this Helmet looked, Marco you... is questioning Sebastian Vettel's Aston Martin motivation. I feel like that question just answered itself. <laughs> like, it why? Why did you leave Red Bull? Right, like I feel like this question just became. You're in, like, but stick to your own team and make fun of your own drivers and make their life terrible. Don't Get go all Toto people. on us. Start yeah. commenting about other people and other teams. What do you mean his motivations to get away from your shit? That's yeah. his motivation. Right. Right. Gosh. Yeah. yeah um, and finally, my final headline is. You're gonna love this one, and this one is goes out to all oh. of our of uh the fans of this uh device especially one paul charsley oh yeah here it is quote get ready for record four drs zones at the albert park we yeah i think you i think you have zone. to you have to read that as if you're like uh, are you ready for some football right like are you ready yeah right four? sunday 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 four drs zones right like <laughs> yeah. the last it's gonna one, be amazing yeah exactly the last one should be named in honor of paul charsley I, you know, I like, agree. The Charlesley zone. <laughs> Highway to the Charlesley zone. Yes, exactly. <laughs> You're going to choke me up. <laughs> and that's Don't how we that. feel, Todd. Oh, my I, gosh. You've just entered the Charlesley zone. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. I like it. I think four DRS zones. I mean, they've done a lot to Albert Park, too. So it'll be interesting to see see what that race brings and right crazy um, action edge of your seat action if you're not on the edge of your seat you're not alive yeah considering you know that's a race where i have to get up at like two in the morning like i have to i have to pre-nap and then get up for the race watch the race and then go yes, back to bed know, so it's brutal uh australia is always always a tough one although and we were talking this earlier that i i prefer when they're not at two in the morning but like you know like the six o'clock eight o'clock mm -hmm. But, you know, when they're in my time zone, like Brazil, ah, it's, I find that's harder because it's like one o'clock right in the middle of your day. And somebody's like, oh, do you want to go to lunch? No, I can't. Uh, you want to go yeah, to right. nah, I can't. Nah, right. Like I it's just yeah. Sunday's done. It's all race I know. day. I know. Where if it it's in the crazy. morning, you can watch the race and digest. You're done. It and you got on. the whole day left. That's right. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah, I kind of like it. All right. <gasps> Let's do some mailbag. You've got mail. All right. This is your friend and mine, Miles. Who I'll jazz up and call him Malaise. <laughs> so Miles uh, sent this question. It's a really good question, Miles. He says, "We've seen in the past where some drivers str struggle with new cars, be it through regulation changes, changing teams, or other reasons. 
If your second driver is outperforming your main driver, when do you make a decision to swap support or move development focus towards the second driver? So I think that depends on the team. So I, I think yeah, it, for sure. I think right if we're talking Mercedes, that's very different than if we're talking Alfa Romero, right? Like yep. Mercedes um, would be very much slower to make that change. Right. Exactly. So yep. um, yeah. Yeah. But, Whereas, uh, you know, like AlphaTauri might make that change pretty quick. Oh, right. Exactly. Yeah. I think, right. Or, you know, one of the right. one of the mid-tack teams might do that, you know. But I, I think the front three, I don't see that happening. Right. It would be yeah. interesting, Ferrari, what would happen if Carlos suddenly just, like, dominates, which would be my dream. That would be yeah, I, you know, I'm, interesting. I'm kind of torn on Ferrari. You know, I kind of feel like Ferrari may tack sooner than others because it's all about the team you know it's true you're right and um and so they may surprise you in that sense um but yeah it's a great point miles because in the past the cars were sort of always developed you think of like the red bull it should be pretty much developed exactly the way that max likes that car right, right. and if it's sergio it's kind of up to him to get on top of it and that's traditionally been in the past how these things were kind of done schumacher car very much designed for michael mm -hmm. rubens just had to you know change figure his driving out. style and figure it out right and so that's very much how that has been in the past i don't know if it's so much that way i'm not saying it's not i'm just saying i don't know if it's so much that way because now it's since the teams are so reliant on the prize money it's critical that those both drivers finish as high on the points as possible, right? Um, so they want to be careful there. But you're right; it causes all kinds of issues. You know, when you uh, you think of like Mercedes, well, you know, look at Rosberg and Hamilton. You know, going at it hammer and tongs, and you could even see moments during that season where Mercedes was trying to keep a lid on Rosberg a little. You know, because right. he was. I mean, he was super aggressive and causing issues, and I get it. Um, but yeah, it's a difficult thing. But as far as developing that car, those cars are pretty much developed. Any sort of future in-season develops to be to improve aerodynamics, grip, those type of things. It's not like it's a wholesale change of the car where it would favor uh, necessarily a, like take Sebastian Vettel. He likes a real pointy car. He doesn't like to wait on the front end. He doesn't like uh, understeer. Um, so if, you know, that car is designed that way, um, you know, be very hard mid season, all of a sudden just to reverse that whole thing, um, and make it uh, very understeery for a guy like Lance. Um, right. so anyway, yeah, it's a great question though. Uh, absolutely. I like and I think, yeah. I think much like we were talking about on the Haas story about like when you bring new development pieces on how much you bring on. I mean, I think this plays into that larger picture as well. When do you say, you know, George has got it. Sorry, Lewis, we're, we're, you're out right or yeah right you know, we're not focused right. on you anymore so um and managing that change so i think right. that would be really i mean again i i used alpha as an example but what if you know botas suddenly does have to be the second fiddle which certainly isn't what he's expecting and nobody else is either right he's racing with a rookie you would expect that right he's going to be dominant this year but what if that doesn't happen well you know you could go back in your team a little bit with uh at mclaren with yeah. uh lewis hamilton when he came in fernando alonso right yeah yeah. They had some hard decisions to make. That is not how Ron saw that going down. Neither right. neither is that how Alonzo saw it. <laughs> it's not how Fred saw it either, right? Nope, that was not the team he was right. expecting. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, point. tough call. All right, well, that does it for this podcast, but we will be back next week uh, to review the race, the Australian Grand Prix in Albert Park in Melbourne. And uh, it's great to be back uh, with all of our Australian friends down there. Hello. And uh, I'm glad that the race is back and uh, looking forward to it very much. But if you want to share your opinion, just do so with Decor and Civility. Go over to theparkforme.com, share your opinion. And if you like the podcast, go to Apple iTunes, give us some love, give us a good rating over there. A huge thank you to our Patreon supporters because we could not and would not do this podcast without you. If we did not have 
the Patreon supporters that we have, this wouldn't exist. So find a Patreon supporter, pat them on the back because they are the reason we exist. If you have ever entertained supporting us, you can go to the website, theparkforme.com. On the right-hand side, it says support us. Click on that. It'll take you to our Patreon page, and you can support us there. So until next week, when we do it all over again, I'll try to find Paul. I hope he's not too busy because it is the race season. Right. And he's going crazy, that Paul Charsley out there with the harder racing Aston Martin number 23 and 27 team. But watch that space with the IMSA race coming up. And until next week, this is Todd, a.k.a. Negative Camber, saying so long, Grace. See you in two weeks. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over.